Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. I know he holds my life, my future in his hands. Amen. Welcome to worship. Would you stand together? Let's lift our voices. Declare to the Lord, these are the things that we believe. because he lives and we can trust him. He is our hope. He is our hope in life and our hope in death. Declare it together as the body of Christ this morning.
hope this day. Would you be seated where you are, please? Well, good morning. As we continue to turn our hearts and minds as we worship this morning, and uh, if you've been reading along with us, our 30-day guide to praying for our one, this morning our scripture passage reading was out of 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. And I want us to begin there. Listen to what the word of the God says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures this morning. And so I want us to begin to just stop and let's just thank the Lord. And maybe in your mind right now, there's something that you need to thank the Lord for this morning. So let's, let's pray. Father, this morning, we're grateful that we have an opportunity to come before you. And Father, we want to say thank you. God, there's so many things that, that are around us, that are pressing in on us, things that we hear, things that we see that are so so negative, and Father, things that seem to distract us. And this morning, Father, we want to say thank you for who you are. Father, we want to say thank you this morning for saving us. Father, may we be reminded of your goodness to us. Father, your steadfastness to us. Father, we want to say thank you. The scripture goes on to say, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Maybe this morning you're here and Maybe there's something in your life that may not be what you want it to be right now. Maybe some things, some, some difficulties and challenges in your life. And maybe right now you want to thank the Lord for the good things in your life. And so let's pray. Father, help us to see those things that are best for us. Father, that we would not settle for the things that the world tells us is good, but Lord, that we would seek your goodness. Father, that we would seek your greatness. Father, that those be the desires of our hearts. Father, make our desires the things that you desire. Move in our hearts and our minds this morning as we think clearly upon you and your goodness. The scripture also says we want to thank the Lord for his goodness, but also his steadfast love. Father, we're grateful this morning for your steadfast love. And Father, how you have demonstrated that through your son, Jesus. And Lord, this morning, may we be reminded of the gravity of our salvation. Father, what we have been saved from, but Lord, what we have been saved to, and that is a relationship with you. And Father, there is nothing that we can do to encourage you to love us any more than you already do. And Father, we are grateful for that steadfast love and for that one who's here today who thinks that there is something in their life that makes them unlovable. Lord, may they be reminded this day that there is nothing that can separate us from you. And Father, because of that, we put our faith and our trust in you, turning from our sins imploring you to do a new work in our heart through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, may you begin this very moment. And Father, we come to you because we've been invited into your presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I do pray. Amen. serve him because of his faithfulness. He is an awesome God. Let's learn this song together. Thank you. 
this last stanza that I got. Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, hung on the cross to die. The faithfulness and we are commanded to glorify him because of that sing this chorus with us great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning my morning, morning, by morning. new mercies I see so grateful that it is great indeed, that your mercies are new every day. This morning when we woke up, God, your mercies were new this day to be enjoyed and shared, to be grateful for. God, we just come before you as your people in gratitude, grateful for the blessing of this day, that your mercies are new, and I pray, God, that your mercies would be real in this place today. Bless us with your word. Teach us that we may be obedient to it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, I don't know if you know this or not. This is something that I just discovered. Did you know that there are stereotypes about preachers? Did you all know that? No, actually, I, I knew that. But there are stereotypes about preachers. For example, particularly Baptist preachers. A Baptist preacher has never seen a piece of fried chicken that he never liked, right? Right? But let me, just, let me just let you in. A Methodist preacher likes fried chicken too. You don't have to be just a Baptist to like fried chicken. Matter of fact, most Americans love fried chicken. There's a few of you who are health conscious and you may not like it, but you're not normal. Uh, but most people like fried chicken. Can I get an amen? Y'all are hungry, aren't you? I just want to know who's cooking the fried chicken today. That's all right. Well, you know, you got the fried chicken joke, and then you have, um, you know, the preacher that preaches too long, those sermons, you know, he's always long-winded preachers and things like that, and, 
And then you, um, then you got the, the joke about, well, the preacher, you only really work one day a week anyway, right? I mean, that's all that you do. And, and uh, Robert and I, we hear those jokes all the time. We smile, but we're rolling our eyes in the back of our head just because we, we've heard all of those things. We've also heard the one, especially, you know, don't let us dare get a new vehicle, right? Preacher, we're paying you too much, right? I had a guy on my staff one day, and, uh, and, uh, and he, uh, I said, over, I'm not a bet man, over, under, five, you know, how many times you get told, we're paying you too much, and needless to say, he bought lunch for me the next day, because it was about six times he was told, and uh, about a year later, I get a vehicle, and they say, well, preacher, we're paying you too much, and I said, no, you're not, because I couldn't get the package that I really wanted on the pickup that I bought, because I didn't have enough, so right, that kind of shut it all down right there, but but there are stereotypes about preachers. I know that. And, um, and it's kind of like if you come to church only on Easter, that you have probably the propensity to say, man, we just sing the same songs every time I come to church. Well, if you come to church only on Easter, you're going to hear up from the grave he arose, right? <laughs> Not saying that we got to sing that, but I mean, most of the time, those are you going to sing. But a lot of times, um, we get this stereotype that, People will say, every time I come to church, the preacher's always preaching on hell. And my response to you is, yeah, we may, we may mention it in a passing glance, but very rarely do you hear a sermon about hell. Matter of fact, in your mind, can you think back the last time you heard a sermon that was just completely designated to talk about hell? You probably had to go way back into your mind. But this morning... I want us to talk about the story of hell this morning. Now, we had a lot of guests this morning. We had the Jones softball team with us this morning. And I know that when they heard that, they're like, whoo, eyes got big this morning. But sometimes you got to talk about it. You got to talk about it. And we're going to speak about the story of hell. Now, one of the clearest passages in all of the New Testament that deal with the subject of hell is actually found in Matthew 25. You don't have to turn there. I'm just kind of hitting and running here just a moment because that's what's going on there. And if you look at the beginning of that passage there, there's coming, the scripture says, a great judgment. A great judgment where God is going to separate the sheep and he's going to separate the goats and all others will go to an everlasting torture is what the scripture says. Now, the reality of hell is not a new concept for um, a lot of the original readers of the New Testament. Therefore, Jesus spoke about this reality, and that's where we find him telling a parable in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 16. And we're going to start reading in verse 19. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke 19. The words will be on the screen, if not. And I want us to talk about this story of the rich man and Lazarus. Scripture tells us there, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried to the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from, from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should arise from the dead. Now, as I read that story and that passage of Scripture, for me personally, that is one of the most graphic and sobering passages in all of Scripture. It just resonates and it grabs my heart and it always forces me to slow down and think through it. 
But one of the most pressing questions that I have when I read this story in Scripture is, is how did a man in hell know that in order to not go to hell, you had to repent? How did he know that? Have you ever thought that there is good theology in hell? But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses, their pastor, the prophets, they will neither be persuaded, the one rise from the dead. And what that tells us this morning is this, is that if you had a family member to die and they were to go to hell and Jesus were to release them from hell and send them back to Ellisville, Mississippi to warn you, the Bible says that there's no more likelihood that you would repent than if you heard me. My prayer this week as I've prepared myself, like many others that have preached before me and years before me, that when you deal with a topic like this, that you preach it with compassion. That you preach it with compassion, that you preach it tenderly, you preach it truthfully, you preach it believingly to help someone. Someone may say, or you may be saying, well, boy, if you, if you preach a message like that, I preach a message on hell, then, then if there's somebody lost in the room, they're going to get saved. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying that that be the case. And I'm praying that that is true. But that's not the only reason that I'm preaching that this morning. Because the majority of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not on your way to hell. The majority of you. You were, but a funny thing happened on your way to hell. Somebody shared the gospel with you and you got saved and you're no longer heading that way anymore. But what I'm preaching it for this morning is that you and I have a propensity to forget that we were headed to that point and that we are no longer heading to that point, but we've forgotten to tell people about it. We're living in a generation that doesn't even like to hear what I'm talking about. You won't hear that on a TV preacher. You just won't hear it. So a lot of people don't even deal with it. And I'm not preaching it just so the lost will be saved. But I hope they will be. I am preaching it so that the saved will get a burden for their one. Do you have a burden for your one? This is the one, as we talked about last week, we're adding to our story each week, the one that you're going to invite to breakfast, the one that you're going to invite to lunch, the one that you're going to invite over for dinner, and you're going to tell them your story. You're not just going to invite them to lunch and hope they get saved. You're going to tell your story. But here in this story, the Bible records the story of a rich man and a poor man, and they both die. That's what we've got going on here in this passage. The poor man goes to heaven, and he is embraced by Abraham. And the, the rich man goes to, dies, and, and he goes and suffers in hell. And the rich man begins to look across the great divide in heaven. And now, that's a whole other sermon for another day. We're not going to get into that particularly this morning. And he asks for mercy. He asks for mercy for someone to warn his family to avoid the place of torment that he is now experiencing in his life. And so can I ask you a question this morning? If Jesus is not going to allow those in hell to come back and warn people of hell, who will? Who will? Who will be the ones? In another example in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story of a, of a future time. Again, when he separates humanity into two groups, the sheep and the goats. He welcomes one, the sheep, with the phrase, enter into my peace. And the other, the goats, he basically says, depart from me, you cursed in everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I stand before you as one who was headed in that direction. I was headed in that direction because I was part of the accursed until someone shared the good news with me. Share the good news of the gospel with me. And here's what the gospel tells us. The gospel is that Jesus became accursed for you and for me. The curse that was going to fall on me, namely the wrath of God, which was the cup in the garden of Gethsemane that was going to be poured out on sinners. Jesus Christ drank that cup and he became accursed for us. That's what the scriptures tell us. So basically where the wrath of God was going to fall on me, where it was going to fall on you, Jesus Christ became the accursed for us so that you and I could be cleansed, we could be forgiven, and we could spend eternity with him. The Bible so often speaks of this reality of hell. One of the most difficult questions for Christians, and, and I bet you've heard this before too. 
When someone would say, how can a good and a loving God send someone to hell? And I not only have a normal answer for that question, I've actually got an abnormal answer for that question. Here's the normal answer. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We go on our own volition because we choose to reject God's accursed son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but he came into the world to save the world through his son, Jesus. Now, here's the abnormal answer. I I didn't need God to condemn condemn me to hell. I was doing a pretty good job on my own. That's why Jesus came to save us, not to condemn us. It's interesting, in 2001, a poll was taken in the U.S., Asking whether or not Americans actually believed in hell. 2001, 71% of Americans said, we believe in hell. But in just seven short years later in 2008, it changed from 71% to 59%. I dare not even imagine what it is in 2021. They asked these same Americans to define what is hell. And, and this is not my definition. This is those who often don't even believe in hell. This is how they define it. We, it is a place where people who have led bad lives and die without being sorry are eternally punished. It's interesting. We love to think about heaven, and we should. But we should never forget the realities of hell. Richard Baxter, preacher of many years ago, a Puritan pastor, he lived his life from this perspective of both heaven and hell, and he, he, he led his church and members to, to think about eternity. And this is what he said. He says, think of the mercy of a night's rest. How many of you guys just, you long for a nice rest to sleep at night? It's nothing more precious and valuable. And how many that have spent that night in hell? How many in in prison? How many in cold, hard lodgings? How many suffering from agonizing pains and sickness, weary of their beds and of their lives? Think of how many souls were that night called from their bodies terrifyingly to appear before God. I think how quickly days and nights are rolling on, how speedily your last night and day will come. Observe that which is lacking in preparedness of your soul for such a time and seek it without delay. And so this morning, my message, I pray to you, is a very simple message. No one is going to need a translator for you as you leave this room today, and there will not be in a parable form. But I want to tell you some truths about hell this morning. And you may already know this, and if you don't know this, if you were to read the New Testament, the New Testament is comprised of 27 individual books made up of the New Testament. And if you read that, you will find that Jesus spoke on hell Three times to every one time he talked about heaven. So it mattered to him. And here's what I want you to know that the Bible says about hell. Here's the first truth. Hell is eternal. It's eternal. It's forever. And eternity is too long to be wrong, right? And I always have scratched my head when when someone is asked, are you saved? Have you been born again? Are you a Christian? And they respond and they'll say something like this, I hope so, I think so, I'm counting on it. If there's a way to know so, this is the one subject that I want to know so about, right? That you want to know about as well. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, these things that I have written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know if you have eternal life. There's a lot of things I don't know. I don't ever consider myself an intellectual. I've studied hard. I try to be disciplined. But I tell you what I know, I know that I know is that you can have eternal life. And I say that with all confidence this morning because of the Word of God. I know that I have eternal life. I know that God has changed me. And any person in Christ is a new creation. I'm not what I ought to be. You can ask my wife. But listen to this. I'm not what I used to be. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ made a difference in my life. And I am glad because I really do believe with all my heart that hell is eternal. It is. And the reason why I share this with you today is because everybody is going to spend eternity somewhere. Somewhere. 
So hell is eternal. But not only is it eternal, hell is a place of pain. The Bible refers here that the man is being tormented. And Jesus, even on one occasion, says it is a place where worms do not die. Jesus would even use the words of gnashing of teeth. And it's not a pretty picture at all. And most don't even want to talk about it. They want to avoid the topic of hell altogether. And those who do talk about it, we're a lot of times stereotyped as called hellfire and brimstone preachers. But can I say something to you? If Jesus talked about it three to one to heaven, that was kind of his in his vocabulary too. We got to hang tight. Why that, well, that ratio We'll learn more about that in just a moment. But hell is a place of pain. But thirdly, hell is a place of sadness. Now, some of you in this room have read Dante's comedy. Uh, I've only read portions of that particular work. And he describes the journey of, of the author who went through hell on his way to heaven. And in the section he calls Inferno, he described the sign that, that is above the entrance of hell. And this is what it says, Abandon hope, all you who enter here. There's no hope for anyone who will ever go to hell. Some faiths won't even let this be part of their conscience that somebody could go that way. So they carry out what is called baptism by proxy. And what they do is they bring people into the baptismal pool and they, will, they baptize you in the name of the person who has already died in hopes that they will come out of hell and will be able to enter into heaven. It's hard for us to grasp that concept and that's where people are pushed to. But ladies and gentlemen, Dante was right. This idea is a divine comedy. And I want to preach the truth to you this morning. And it's not a joking matter. Hell is a sad place. It is a place of sadness. But it's also a place of fear. His truths, God's truth, they are designed to warn us. Somebody says, I went and heard the preacher and he scared the hell out of me. And my response is, good. Good. Some of you, on the other hand, your stories may include a caveat like this. That the Lord began to convict your heart. The Holy Spirit began to work in your life to a point in your life where someone actually tried to talk you out of it. Oh, that's just uh, your imaginations. That's just uh, the emotionalism of things. Yeah, those Baptists are known for those hellfire and brimstone sermons. How many of you are like me that you are grateful this morning that sometimes when God gets a hold of your core, it rocks you to the very core of your being? Aren't you glad? What this message this morning is intended to do is to give you some caution lights. You ought to leave here this morning with lights blinking in your mind. The message of Jesus is slowing you down. And I pray that it will stop you in your tracks this morning. Hell is a place of fear, but hell is also a place of isolation. Some of you may fall into this category. Maybe before you got saved, you thought if there was any possibility that before you drew your last breath, that you would go to hell, but you thought this. Well, if I go to hell, oh, so-and-so is going to be with me. John's going to be with me. Jim's going to be with me. Joe's going to be with me. Sam's going to be with me. Everybody you knew was going to hell, and you thought, well, hell, it's not going to be that bad if all my buddies are there with me, right? Maybe you thought that before. There's only one thing that's wrong with that idea. There's no record in the Bible of any fellowship whatsoever taking place in hell. To the contrary, and, and by the way, listen to this. this. This is important. In hell, in hell, the man that's there, he's not looking for fellowship. He's not. He's now praying. And he's saying, somebody go and tell my five brothers, at least they come here. The last thing that you want to see in hell is somebody else there. Hell is a place of isolation, but hell is also a place of separation. I'm grateful this morning that as I got up, I know some of you were thinking, man, I could have slept in another hour or two. Probably so. I probably could have too. But as I got up this morning and got awoke a little bit in the shower and you began thanking God that you can get up today, right? That I got up again today, that I get to set a day aside to worship. I'm going to be able to gather corporately with my church family to worship the Lord. And you begin to thank the Lord that you can, that you can see all of your friends and fellowship. And you were thanking God for all of those things. 
But no, sir, not in hell. There'll never be a good morning in hell. There will never be a good morning in hell. There will never be a good night. Why? Because you're in hell. No wonder when somebody gets mad at somebody, they'll, they'll tell them to, to go to hell because you cannot think of a more horrible place that you'd rather somebody go. Have you ever thought about that? Why do we not say, well, well, well you, you go to heaven. Why do we not say that? Or, well, well you, you go to Krispy Kreme or something like that. Why do we not do that? There's no worse place than we would rather see somebody. It's in our core. I believe God created us that way. When the truth is, is as believers, as followers of Jesus, we don't want anybody to go to hell. I've given my life to, to preach a gospel that would intersect every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Why in the heaven would anybody in here choose to decide volitionally to go to hell? Why? So as we think about hell as a place of separation, I also want to throw a, a wrench in things this morning. I want to talk to you about some good things I found about hell. It's interesting. Here's the first good thing about hell. Good people are in hell. Someone said, well, I don't think he's going to hell. He's such a good man, just a good man. Good people go to hell. Morally speaking, you and I know people who are good folks that are not followers of Jesus. And I know some people that are not Christians that live better than folks that claim to be Christians, right? The Bible says now compared to Jesus and the glory of God, there's none good. No, not one that is good. But according to human standard, our standards, let me tell you what I found out about the rich man. The rich man here that I never considered. You say, well, how in the world can you say that he was good? He wouldn't even give this guy the crumbs from his table. Let me tell you what he did do, though. He let him sit at his gate and beg. Now, if you were to go home this afternoon, it may not be afternoon before you get home because the preacher is not that long-winded, right? I just caught myself. <laughs> if you, when you go home this afternoon and you drive into your driveway at your house and there is a homeless man who's sitting at your mailbox, he's wrapped up in a blanket, got a little basket. Would you ask him to leave or would you call the police? What would you do in that situation? I know that what you're thinking, you, you'd go out there and you'd give that person something to eat. You'd invite them in. You, you'd probably do that. And that's, that's why I like hanging out with you guys. You are so compassionate. That's what you do, right? But the bottom line here is this. Here's a man. He wasn't all bad. He let the guy stay at his gate. And if that man was pretty well to do for a blind man and a beggar, that's a good place to be, right? This is what I mean by that. When I was a kid, I used to love to go trick-or-treating, and I always wanted my mama to take me to the rich folks' neighborhood, right? <laughs> that was Kimberly's neighborhood. To the rich folks' neighborhood. <laughs> we lived one street over. <laughs> um, because they had the full Reese's peanut butter cups, a full Snickers bar. They didn't have just like candy corn and butterscotch and peppermints and things like that. I wanted to go trick-or-treating in the good neighborhood where the rich folks live because you knew you were going to get some good candy. And I still like my kids to go there too because I have to pay that tax. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> trick-or-treating tax. But you try to get your parents to drop you off into those neighborhoods because those people had better candy. You see, the, what happened here in the story, if you read carefully, the poor man here, he asked his friends to pick him up and take him to the rich man's gate. Carry me down there. That man's got a lot of money. He's got a big house. And if I, could, if I could just get down there, the people that come to his house, they are loaded and I will make some money. But that man, the rich man, let him sit there. And so there was some goodness in him, right? But let me tell you something. If you've been hung on the fact that you don't think that you're going to hell because you're good, you can go to hell a good man. Hell is full of good men and women. 
of people that were kind, people that were courteous. There are good people in hell. But not only are there good people in hell, there's good vision in hell. The Bible says, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw that Lazarus was far off. His vision was so good in hell, he could see what was missing. The man's in hell and he's able to, to see all the way into heaven. God allowed it to happen undoubtedly and he's able to see what he's missing. There is good vision in hell. But not only is there good vision, there are good prayers in hell. As a matter of fact, this man had prayed the prayer. If he had prayed this particular prayer in his real life that he prayed in hell, he wouldn't have gone to hell, right? He prayed that God would have mercy on him. It says that he lifted up and he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, send this guy that he may dip the tip of his finger into water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Somebody says, do you believe there's a literal fire in hell? I do. Scripture says so right here. Are there good prayers in hell? Yes. Here's another. You got good memory in hell. When it comes to memory, aren't you grateful today that there's some things that you can forget, but there's sometimes there's some things that you can't forget. We all have those things, the things that we're embarrassed about, things that we wish we could do over again. But I got to thinking about this passage. And this is what he says here. Son, you remember? Remember that in your lifetime, you received good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted and you are tormented. What is this about memory? Listen here. That's what you'll have in hell. Consciousness, memory, awareness. What will it be that you remember? Somebody in this service particularly may, may not get saved. You may not. You may live to be 85 and then you go to hell and then one day you'll be able to remember this sermon. As a matter of fact, I, and I hope this is not true, you might even be the one that makes fun of a preacher for preaching a sermon like this. I can't believe in this sophisticated 2021, he's so archaic, he's still preaching about hell, a literal hell. Memory. And maybe you're like me this morning that you can smell something and it takes you back to a place. You ever been there before? Or a song that you hear on the radio and it takes you back to a place that you once had been there before. How about in hell? In hell, your memories are flooded. And the bad memories, what could be more agonizing than having to deal with that all the time? Oh, to God, I didn't have time to do it. I've lived 85 years and I can never find the time to follow Jesus. It's a good memory in hell. Fifthly, there's good theology in hell. We already talked about that. Here he realized that God existed. There are no atheists in hell. And you may say, well, I don't believe there's a God. But one day you will. One day you will. Everyone in hell believes the Bible. Oh, men just wrote it. It's just some guys that wrote the Bible. They all know that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 about hell, everyone on the earth, everyone in heaven, and everyone under the earth will bow and say that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so here's the sad thing about hell. You don't get away with anything. Do you know that sometimes for us, practically speaking, the only time that we really believe in hell is when someone really deserves it? that terrorists or that mass murderer who takes the life of innocent people then takes his own life. And none of you say, when you look at their life, wow, they're going to heaven. We never think that, do we? What do we usually say? We say there's a special place in hell for people like that, don't we? Hell is good for our ideology. Hell makes sense for you, but it's because you think that only people worse than you go there. There's good theology in hell, 
but there's also good priorities in hell. He says, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they come here. You know what? They believe in evangelism in hell. They're asking him to send someone back to knock on their door, to go to their house. People in hell are wishing that someone would go to their family and tell them, let's not be the population of hell, be more concerned over who's going to hell than people in the church are concerned about people going to hell. By the way, the man here in hell, he had five people on his prayer list. How many people have we prayed for over the last five years that they wouldn't go to hell. He says, listen to them. Testify means to witness to them. We are to be witnessing. We are to be witnessing our story of the gospel. The Bible says, lest they come here. There are good priorities in hell, but there are also good intentions in hell. I'm telling you, think about this. We talk about it, that hell it's filled, or the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You heard that saying before? And so what do we mean that we say that, that, that good intentions are hell, are, are in hell? You see, one can outrightly reject Christ. We can do that. We can reject Christ in outright rebellion. But I don't know a lot of people who do that. You may, but I don't. I've been a Christian for a long time, and hardly does anyone ever say to me, I don't care if I go to hell, get that gospel stuff out of here, get that Jesus stuff out of here. You just don't hear a lot of people saying that. Hardly ever do I run into an ardent, obstinate people that don't want to hear about it, but the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ does not have to be active. What do I mean by that? One can deny and can refuse Jesus Christ through apathy, through indifference, through procrastinations, even through ignorance. Oh, I don't know what all you got to do to, to get saved, but I guess I'll get saved one of these days. One of these days. Hell is full of people that never intended to go there. They had good intentions. And again, it's been said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You may be saying, well, Pastor, what do I have to do? What have you got to do not to go to hell? What you do is you need to repent of your sins. You need to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Your sins will be dealt with. Your sins will be dealt you, and they will send you to hell if they are not dealt with. But you got to be sorry for your sin and ask God to forgive you and for Jesus Christ and him alone to come and to, to rule your life. But you also got to do it while you're alive. Nobody's going to get a second chance. Somebody said, well, I tell you what, I'm so good with my words that when I get there, I can talk myself into heaven. It's much like the same person in my family who told me, as I shared the gospel with them, well, me and God got this understanding. No, you and God don't have the understanding. Satan has blinded your eyes, and you've talked yourself into it. But you got to do it while you're alive. And listen, here's the harder one. You also got to do it while you're in your right mind. And I think some of you know where I'm going with this. I had a chance one day, I had a phone call in my office, and somebody said, would you like to tell somebody about Jesus today? I'm like, sure, great, I'll do that. Well, can you go and see my father? And so I go and I go to this man's home and I make a visit, and I could tell right off the bat, he was gone. Mentally, he was gone. And I made the comment, and I said, do you, do you know Jesus? And his response back to me was, who? And his eyes just began to, to glass over again. More and more, we see our relatives fighting battles that do that to their mind. But we also have to come to grips with Jesus while we're in our right minds. But ladies and gentlemen, while you're in your right mind, this morning, you have the opportunity. You need to repent and to give your life to Jesus. God lovingly made a way for you. 
Somebody says, well, oh, that's, that's just a fire escape. That's all that is. No, if this is just a fire escape, you're still going to hell, right? Hell is not a fire escape. Jesus is a Savior. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's the creator of the universe. He made you in the first place and bought you on the cross. That is who he is, friends. And you better respond while the gospel still appeals to you. See, God may seek to draw you today, and you may say, well, I'll, I'll come when I want to. I'll do it another day. And the door may begin to close, and you may never sense again what you're seeing and sensing right now. Some of you right now, guys, you need to look at your wife and you say, I need you to go with me in just a moment as he makes that altar call, and I need to come to Jesus. Some of you ladies need to say right now, I've been playing games, and I've never known on the inside. Some of you children need to say to your mom and your dad, I need Jesus, mom and dad. I need him desperately. Some of you as a family, as individuals, ought to come this morning to Jesus. And let me say this. Based on Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, hell was not prepared for any of us. The Bible says that it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not prepared for any people. It was prepared for the fallen angels and the devil himself. But on the contrary, heaven was prepared for us. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And his disciples said, Lord, we know not the way, and how can we know? And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, the Son. You can spend eternity in a place that was not made for you, or you can spend eternity in a place that was made for you. And it all depends this day what you do with Jesus. What you do with Jesus. Would you repent this morning? If you've never been saved this morning, I want, to, I want you to hear from me for just a moment. If you say, Pastor, I don't know that if I walked out of this room today, and before I die, and I got to hear you again, I would go to heaven. Maybe that's you this morning. And you've been wanting to settle this once and for all and forever. And maybe on this fifth weekend in 2021, you want to settle this once and for all today. This morning, you want to repent of your sin. You want to put your faith and trust in the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if that is the desire of your heart this morning, this day, and you're acknowledging that you are a sinner and you're sorry for your sins, you acknowledge that you don't have to be a curse because Jesus Christ was a curse for you and you want to receive his payment of the cross, the wrath he absorbed for you that, so that you could be saved this morning. If that's your desire, would you, would you ask him right now? Right now in this moment, I want to ask you this morning to bow your heads with me. And if that's you this morning, I want you to, to pray a prayer similar to this. Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. Would you please come into my life and save me? Cleanse me of my sins. Come and live in me. I give you my life, and I receive your life. I mean that with all of my heart, this commitment to Jesus Christ. Oh, God, help me to live the remaining days of my life for you. And if you're here this morning, and that's a prayer that you've prayed this morning with sincerity, in just a moment as we sing together, I want to invite you to come. I'm going to be standing right here, and I want you to take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I gave my life to Jesus this morning. Let us celebrate with you. Let us celebrate with you. Let us encourage you. We want to do that. We want to walk with you, help you grow as a follower of Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and you've been burdened even deeper for your one. And maybe God is just burdening you and burdening you. And maybe you need to spend some time on these altars this morning praying for your one. Or maybe there's something else in your life. Maybe you just need to be prayed for. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Be honored to do that. But as we stand together and sing, you do what the Lord's leading you to do.
So let's stand together and sing this morning. Before the throne of God. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in peace for me. My name is great. Satan tempts me. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, of word I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior. Amen. Aren't you thankful that we can spend eternity in a place that was prepared for us? Not a place that wasn't. May that be something that we chew on, meditate on, and may it fuel us. Fuel us in our relationship with not only the Lord, but also as we live our life in the overflow of that relationship with others around us. So glad that you're here with us this morning. If you are a guest with us, there's a connection card on the, in the pew rack in front of you. It'll take just a second and fill that out and drop it in one of our offering boxes at the exit before you leave. We'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, there's a section for us to pray for you, and we'd love and be honored to pray for you. And if you hadn't had a chance to worship through giving, you can do that as well as you walk out the door through those offering boxes. Don't forget, by this Wednesday, we, um, you need to sign up if you're going to participate in the Super Super Bowl Sunday luncheon next Sunday, the virtual pass-through to-go luncheon thing. Uh, you need to do that on our website, firstbaptistellisville.com. Uh, I've signed up for the shrimp bisque. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Ms. Francis said it was going to be awesome. We're going to take her by her word, right? We're going to sign up for it and do that next week. And, um, and also, if you have not got your ballot, uh, second nomination or final nomination ballot, please do that before you leave today, too. Take that and drop that in the offering box before you leave. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you again for the moment that we've had today. Thank you for loving us, for never leaving us nor forsaking us. But, Lord, you have prepared a place for us, and you have gone ahead of us to prepare that place and Father, you will come again and you will gather us to yourself because where you are is where we want to be. God, we're thankful that we know the way, the truth, and the life, and that is through you, your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we rest our eternal salvation safely and securely at the feet of the cross. And Father, this day as we depart these walls, God, we may be used for your glory, for your honor in all that we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There will be family standing hand in hand, and we will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Hallelujah. There will be healing from this heartache. We've been feeling. We're singing the darkest night, because we know that the Every tongue will confess One day when I'm tired